Hey y'all, before I dive into this story, I want to give a huge thanks to Audible for sponsoring this episode. With an Audible membership, you can download titles and listen offline, anywhere, anytime. You can download the Audible app for free under your smartphone and tablet and listen across devices without losing your spot. It's filled with thousands of audiobooks, original entertainment, guided fitness, meditation, sleep tracks for better rest, and podcasts, including ad-free versions of your favorite shows and exclusive series. Audible has the largest selection of audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, languages, business, and more, like original entertainment from top celebrity creators and thousands of popular binge-worthy podcasts. Audible members also receive one credit every month for any title in their premium selection. That includes the latest bestseller, the buzziest news release, the hottest celebrity memoir, or that bucket list title you've been meaning to pick up. So visit audible.com forward slash truecrimecam today or text truecrimecam to 500 to start exploring Audible with a free 30-day trial. Again, that's audible.com forward slash truecrimecam, or text truecrimecam to 500 and start exploring Audible with a free 30-day trial now. This is a place for all relations Bring celebration to meditation Giving thanks for all creation We are so provided for 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 To onlookers at music festivals, spectators on social media, and distant friends, the Hart family was special. They preached positivity, love, and radiated a sense of joy that everyone felt. They were politically active and advocated for environmental and social justice regularly. One child even went viral for hugging a police officer at a Black Lives Matter protest. But as progressive and caring the Hart family looked on the outside, they had a very dark secret. This secret continued to grow for years until the truth finally came out. And when the truth did come out, Sarah and Jen would commit the most cruel act that would shock the entire world. On March 26, 2018, at 3.38 p.m., a German tourist named Kirsten Pelzer called the Ukiah Communications Center. She reported that there was an overturned brown sport utility vehicle. It was down a 100-foot embankment in the Pacific Ocean at the Wan Creek Crossing on Highway 1 in Mendocino County. Jennifer Hart, the driver of the vehicle, had gone full throttle off the cliff. There was no indication to investigators that she had tried to break it all. It was discovered later that her blood alcohol concentration was 0.102%, well above the legal level of 0.08%. Sarah Hart and the children they tested at the crash site had a significant amount of antihistamine in their systems. It took just five seconds for the Hart family to go from the top of the cliff to the rocky shoreline below. No one in the SUV had been wearing their seatbelts. Rescue officials discovered five bodies at the crash site. 38-year-olds Jennifer and Sarah Hart and three of their adoptive children, 19-year-old Marcus and 14-year-olds Abigail and Jeremiah, 16-year-old Hannah, and 15-year-olds Sierra and Devante were not immediately found. However, investigators believe that the whole family was in the SUV at the time of the crash. Jennifer Hart was still at the wheel, and Sarah Hart was trapped between the roof and seats of the rear of the vehicle. Authorities reported that the speedometer was pinned at 90 miles per hour, which means that Jennifer was still accelerating up until the point that they crashed into the rocks at the bottom. From this discovery alone, it's clear that either something went terribly wrong or Jennifer didn't want any survivors. Because Marcus, Abigail, and Jeremiah had not been wearing their seatbelts at the time of the crash, this led investigators to believe that the other three children had not been either. 
The other three children were not immediately found. Authorities suggested their bodies had been ejected from the vehicle or swept away by the ocean's intense waves. Months later, authorities had recovered the body of Sierra and the severed foot of Hannah, which was identified through DNA analysis. To this very day, Devante's body has yet to be found. Sarah Gingler grew up in Big Stone, South Dakota, a small town that borders Minnesota. It's so small, in fact, the population in 2019 was only 456. 97.9% .9 of those people were white. Sarah's dad worked at a hardware business and her mom for a local cheese factory. The Seattle Times interviewed several people that knew Sarah growing up, and no one had anything bad to say about her. They claimed nothing stood out to them at all, at least, nothing that could predict the atrocities she and her future wife would commit. Jennifer Hart grew up in Huron, South Dakota, with her parents and two brothers. The town had a population of 13,380 in 2019, the highest it's ever been. Of that population, 86.9% were white. According to the Oregon news outlet that interviewed Jennifer's father, Douglas Hart, he and Jennifer's mother got a divorce when she was 12. When Jennifer was 14, she moved across town to live with her father. However, Douglas couldn't be home to watch Jen at all times, and apparently she started breaking the rules. Jen's father eventually forced her to move back in with her mother. Douglas stated, quote, I will never, ever, 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 ever believe my daughter would do such a thing. I just don't believe she would take her own life, or her spouse's life, or her six children's lives." End quote. However, evidence suggests that Jennifer Hart did all three of those things. Apparently, Jen and her father had been distant for a while. He simply believes that something went terribly wrong. After Jen graduated from Huron High School in 1997, she enrolled in Augustana University, a Lutheran school. In 1999, she transferred to Northern State University, and that's where she met her then-future wife, Sarah Gingler. The two were both studying the same field, elementary education. When Jen and Sarah began their relationship, Jen would refer to Sarah as her roommate. The two eventually became roommates, but they were also dramatically in love, according to Nasheen Bakhtiar, a close friend since 2013. In January of the year 2000, Jen pled guilty to petty theft. She had stolen a pair of Nike running shoes and 25 packs of sports trading cards. According to a police report, an officer noted, quote, Hart also told me that there had been a lot happening lately that could have caused her to do it, end quote. In 2001, Jen stopped contacting her father after the two had a disagreement. Douglas Hart claimed this had nothing to do with her sexuality and that Jen had not even told him she was in a relationship with a woman. In 2002, Sarah graduated and Jen dropped out before earning her degree. In 2004, the couple settled in Alexandria, Minnesota and started building a life together. On March 4, 2006, they adopted three children, seven-year-old Marcus, two-year-old Abigail, and four-year-old Hannah. Tammy Shurich, the biological mother of the three, voluntarily gave up custody rights to her children after a long battle with drug addiction. Tammy said she was trying to make, quote, the most unselfish decision for her children, end quote. She hoped that the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services would place her children in the care of a loving family, a family that could give them everything they needed and more. The Hearts adopted the children through the Permanent Family Resource Center in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. A caseworker for the Hart Family Adoption said, quote, the Hart family takes every opportunity to celebrate the children's ethnic heritage, end quote. The Hart women had even completed 15 hours of training on racial diversity excitement. The caseworker also recommended that the Hearts be allowed to adopt more children. Later, it would be discovered that the same permanent family resource center was closed for multiple code violations. 
71-year-old Lorraine Feely lived across the street from the Hart family and knew Sarah and Jennifer as, quote, real friendly girls. However, Lorraine said she didn't know the children well at all. She claimed that Jen and Sarah didn't let them out of the house very often, but when they did, she noticed that they were very highly disciplined. Lorraine noticed that on the rare occasion the children did come out of the house, they would come down the steps in single file. Lorraine told the New York Times that it wasn't like normal kids. Two years later, in June of 2008, Sherry Heard, the biological mother of Devante, Jeremiah, and Sierra, had her children taken away. Sherry had failed to complete a drug rehabilitation program. Nathaniel Davis, the children's stepfather, sought custody of the children, but they didn't see him fit to take care of them. Priscilla Celestine, an aunt of the children, fought hard to keep custody of them, and she thought that she had a chance, considering she was the children's blood relative. She loved them, and she knew them. Priscilla even relocated from a three-bedroom to a five-bedroom house to better provide for the children's needs. However, when the department discovered that Sherry Heard had once babysat the kids while Priscilla was called into work, they removed them immediately. Shonda Jones, a family law attorney assigned to the children's case, fought on Priscilla's behalf. She claims that the Family and Protective Services never gave Priscilla a chance to prove that she would be an adequate guardian, and that removing the kids suddenly was an injustice. Instead of the department allowing Priscilla a chance to take care of the children, the three of them were shipped to a random couple in Minnesota, Jen and Sarah Hart. Shonda claims the situation could have been handled a lot more humanely, especially because the biological family knew nothing of the adopters and their environment. Nathaniel Davis said the system took his life away from him that day because those children were his life. In an email Jennifer Hart wrote to an unknown receiver, she says, quote, We finalized their adoption last month. Thank goodness. I've been a ball of anxiety just waiting for the day to come. Until a couple months ago, a maternal aunt was trying to get them back. Long story, happy ending. Or beginning, moreover. End quote. The system removed these children from their homes and placed them in a new foreign one states away, a house with two women that would isolate them, abuse them, neglect them, and withhold their basic needs. So in a way, Jennifer was right. This was the beginning, but it wasn't a happy one. This was the beginning of the end for the hearts and their now six adopted children. Jennifer and Sarah married the next year, in 2009. In March of that year, Jennifer revealed that Sarah was trying to get pregnant. In an email to someone, she wrote, quote, After 10 years of talking about this, we have decided on a donor. This month will be the first time she will have done the actual procedure. End quote. In July, she wrote that the doctor couldn't locate the heartbeat of the baby, and six days after that, she told them that the baby didn't make it. In August of 2010, Jennifer emailed another woman complaining about her wife. She wrote, quote, For quite some time I have felt underappreciated and taken for granted in our relationship, and at times unloved. While I know deep down in my heart how much she loves me, she is just horrible about showing it. End quote. Because Sarah had been the only one working a job, Jennifer was left to take care of their six children. Jennifer felt she had been raising them on her own and wrote that she needed a break. Three months later, Abuse allegations against the Hart women surfaced in November of that year. Abigail Hart, who was at the time just six years old, told her teacher she had owies on her back and stomach. She told the teacher, quote, Mom hit me, according to court records. The teacher then lifted Abigail's shirt and discovered bruising from her chest down to her belly button as well as her back. Detective Sergeant Larry Daly went to interview the couple due to the allegations. Abigail told Detective Larry and a county social worker that Jennifer had gotten angry with her about a penny. Apparently, a penny had fallen from Abigail's pocket onto the floor. 
This caused Jen to take Abigail to the bathroom, put her hands around her neck, and shove her head in cold water, as well as hit her with her fist. Abigail also claimed she was routinely punished by being grounded. For most kids, this would simply mean that they couldn't play with their toys or watch TV. But for Abigail and the rest of the children, this meant that they were spanked, forced to stay in bed for hours, and withheld food. Jen and Sarah had a different story for what happened to six-year-old Abigail. They claimed it was in fact Sarah who hit her, and that because she was angry over her lying, she bent her over the bathtub and hit her backside. Sarah said she had just lost her temper and got carried away. She also suggested that Abigail was confused by who did this because Jen was the one who stayed at home with the kids and played a dominant role in their children's lives. In April of 2011, Sarah pled guilty to a misdemeanor charge of domestic assault. She only received a 90-day suspended sentence and a $300 fine. This wasn't the first abuse allegation against the Hart women. The first allegation came in 2008 from Hannah. She told a social worker and authorities that Jen had struck her arm with a belt, leaving a bruise behind. When Jen and Sarah were questioned, they claimed that the child had fallen down some stairs a few days earlier. They also claimed that Hannah was having food issues, like stealing food at school, eating out of the garbage cans, or off the ground. Apparently, the authorities thought the children were troubled and the Hart women were telling the truth because they closed the case. While being interviewed in November of 2010 about the now second abuse allegations, Jen and Sarah skewed the conversation to make themselves out as victims. They said they got funny looks from neighbors and churchgoers and that their kids were picked on at school. Alexandria, Minnesota had a population of 11,070 people in 2010 and 96.3% of them were white. It's fair to say that the white lesbian couple was probably getting some looks when walking around with their six adopted black children, but it's also fair to say that they probably wanted to move because this was their second abuse case against them, not just because they were getting funny looks. There was evidence, however, of more than 30 phone calls to police involving a feud with a male neighbor. The man admitted that in June of 2009, he had, quote, made some comments about the Hart's sexuality. Just four days after Sarah Hart was arrested, Jen posted to Facebook that they had contacted a real estate agent and planned to sell their house and move. And while all of this was going on, Jennifer was documenting the lives of her children, frequently posting them to her Facebook. Her Facebook account has since been taken down, but the remaining photos floating around are almost too perfect. In 2006, before the Hart women had adopted their six children, they were fostering a 15-year-old girl. However, the girl was removed from their home in February of that year because of her, quote, suicidal idealizations and threats. It's not known what the girl went through while living with the Hart family or what she endured. But we know that the Hart woman's statement can't be entirely trusted, considering they did much worse to their new adoptive children. The Hart said that they were planning on adopting children, and quote, didn't want the negative energy to impact their children. What's troubling is that they didn't even tell the girl that they were giving up her custody. They simply dropped her off at a therapist appointment and never returned. The therapist had to inform her that the Hart women wouldn't be back, and that the arrangement hadn't been a good fit. All the girl's belongings were dropped off later at her new temporary home, and that's the last she ever heard of them. In 2011, Hannah told her school nurse that she hadn't had any food. Jennifer Hart was enraged by this and shoved a banana and nuts into Hannah's mouth. Sarah then argued that Hannah was just playing the food card and should only be given water. A child welfare worker made a report stating that the school stopped reporting these allegations of abuse and neglect because they feared for the children's safety. This alludes to the fact that any time the children shared with others that they were being abused or neglected, they would be punished for it. This further silenced the kids about speaking out about the abuse and enabled Sarah and Jennifer to continue their behavior. Another concept enabling the abuse and neglect to continue for the Hart children is how people perceived the family. A Minnesota welfare worker wrote that Jennifer and Sarah looked normal. 
This normalcy that the Hart women portrayed, in combination with the white privilege they had, were strong factors in keeping these welfare allegations swept under the rug. The biological mother of Marcus, Abigail, and Hannah had her children taken away, despite the fact that the children's aunt was fighting hard for their custody. So why were these two women allowed to keep six children they had been abusing and neglecting for years? In 2011, the Hart women pulled all six of their children out of public school and started homeschooling them. They had a close call with the child welfare department, and the only way to stop the abuse allegations was to isolate their children further. As soon as assessments and services were concluded by the Minnesota Child Welfare Department in early 2013, the Hart family packed up all of their belongings and moved to Westland, Oregon. That same year, the Oregon Department of Human Services received an anonymous report on July 18th. This person claimed that the Hart children appeared malnourished and neglected. The Oregon Department called officials in Minnesota to get an accurate background on the family's history. Through this, the Oregon Department learned that the Hart family had six reports of abuse or neglect. Only two of those reports were deemed founded by the Minnesota Child Welfare Department. For those prior allegations, the Harts had to complete in-home therapy, counseling, and other skill-building activities. The following is the collection of allegations and reports about the Hart family that the Oregon Department of Human Services had access to. In November of 2010, Abigail was reported to have been going through the garbage at school and taking other classmates' food. This was ruled out. On November 4, 2010, Jen had hit Abigail's head against the wall. There was no marks to back this up. It was ruled out. On November 15, 2010, the physical mistreatment of Abigail Hart was reported. This was the abuse allegation I went into detail earlier in this episode. Abigail accused Jennifer of the abuse, but Sarah ended up taking the fall. And this entire altercation was supposedly over a penny in Abigail's pocket. This was deemed founded. On December 12th, 2010, Hannah Hart had a dime-sized bruise on her hand from Jennifer hitting her. The report said it was because Hannah lies. Hannah also reported that Jen hits her all the time. This allegation was open for an assessment, but there was no determinations. On January 4th, 2011, it was reported that Hannah's classmates were giving her food, and she had been approaching them for food as well. On January 14th, 2011, Hannah reported that she hadn't eaten. I went into detail about this allegation earlier in the episode as well. Hannah said Jen told her she was being disrespectful and shoved a banana and nuts into her mouth. And Sarah said that Hannah was just playing the food card. And this is around the time the school stopped reporting allegations of abuse and neglect because they knew the children were being punished for it. Anytime Sarah and Jen were confronted with the fact that their children looked years younger than their actual age, they would talk about their kids being adopted and high risk with food issues. The Oregon Child Welfare Department began an investigation of their own into the Hart family. The CPS report notes that on July 19, 2013, a worker tried making contact with the Hart family by dropping by their house at 10.30 a.m. The Harts only had two vehicles, and those two vehicles were in the driveway when the worker arrived. However, after knocking on the door several times, they received no answer. The CPS worker left their card with a note attached asking that the Hart family contact them. It's unlikely that with both of the vehicles in the driveway, the family of eight could not have been anywhere but home. That same day, a detective drove by the Hart residence and noted that the suburban vehicle was now gone. Sarah Hart left a message for the CPS worker, stating that she had found their card when taking out the trash. The CPS worker contacted Sarah and made her aware of the allegations and the process of an assessment. Sarah told the CPS worker that she had just missed them that day. Apparently, they had all been on the coast picking berries that day and made sure to let the CPS worker know that the family traveled a lot. That still didn't explain the only two vehicles they owned being in the driveway and the women still not answering the door. Sarah mentioned that Jennifer would be taking the kids to a festival that weekend and they wouldn't be home. She also had no idea where exactly Jennifer was even taking the children. She just knew it was out of state and out of reach of CPS. 
Sarah made the excuse of having a new job with no time off, so she wouldn't be available to meet either. Her excuse for the allegation of the children being undernourished was that the family was vegetarian and just more slender. Sarah claimed that Hannah is just very petite and that her growth hormones were checked when she was younger and there was no problem. At the end of the conversation, Sarah said the children weren't home now and she would call Jennifer to ask when they would be returning to Portland. The CPS worker didn't get to assess the Hart family until over a month after they visited the home for the first time. On August 26th, two CPS workers entered the Hart residence. Of course, the women started off by presenting the best image possible of their children by having them seated at the kitchen table, all coloring. After everyone was introduced, one of the CPS workers wanted to talk with each child individually. Sarah and Jen were hesitant at this. The worker explained that it was typical procedure. The couple told them that they wanted to meet together instead of individually like the children were. All that we have of these interviews are notes made by the CPS workers. Many of these notes stuck out. Before we get into the interviews with the Hart family, I want to preface this with the allegations from two anonymous women that knew the Hart family personally. These allegations are noted down alongside the interview notes taken by CPS. The claims these women made about the Hart family are entirely different from the lives the Harts claim to lead. One of these women had even been cut off from the family after expressing concern about Jennifer's punishments. One woman recalled having the family over several times. They had ordered pizza, but Jen only allowed the children one small piece each. The next morning, the rest of the pizza was gone. When the woman casually mentioned it to her husband, Jennifer overheard and became infuriated. She took all of her children into the bathroom. When they came out, she told the woman's husband that none of the children would be having breakfast because none of them fessed up to eating the pizza. As a punishment, Jennifer forced her children to lie on the ground in the dark for four to seven hours, unable to move. If Jennifer was comfortable refusing food in front of others, imagine the abuse the children were suffering behind closed doors. The first time one of the anonymous women met Jennifer, Devante said he was, quote, starving. The woman suggested that they stop and get him something to eat. Jennifer responded that Devante wasn't hungry. Devante then denied ever saying he was hungry in the first place. The woman thought this was really strange, she also reported that Jennifer would only feed the children tiny portions and wouldn't allow them to have seconds. The children would eat freely when Jennifer wasn't around, but as soon as she entered the room, they would deny eating anything. Jennifer would rarely allow direct interactions between her children and anyone else other than her and her wife. When the woman confronted Jennifer about how little she was feeding Hannah, Jennifer told the woman that Hannah had been morbidly obese before coming to her. There's no evidence of Hannah ever being obese. This woman claimed that the children had to raise their hands before speaking, and they weren't allowed to laugh at the dinner table. On one occasion, Marcus had gotten in trouble at school on his birthday. As a punishment, Jennifer told the children that they weren't allowed to tell Marcus happy birthday. During their family yoga sessions, Jennifer would have them do intense positions that are uncomfortable for long periods of time. One of the women witnessed Jennifer punish Marcus for making a comment that Jennifer didn't like by forcing him to lay in a dark room for seven total hours. One of the anonymous close family friends reported that Jennifer was manipulative and controlling in the relationship with Sarah. She also reported that at one point Jen wanted to leave Sarah for her and had become obsessed. Obviously, Jennifer didn't leave her wife, and we don't know if this claim was true. However, the woman also reported something that might align with the narrative of who the Hart family truly was. She told the CPS worker that Jennifer always made up extravagant stories to make herself appear a hero and that she was completely delusional. She stated that Jennifer views the children as animals before they came to her, and she as their savior. She believed that Jennifer liked to parade the children around at music festivals and even stage them for photographs, but in reality, Jennifer gave them little attention after the cameras and crowds were gone. The same was said about Sarah Hart as well. She claimed that Sarah was in reality cold to the children and only liked to parade them around for attention. To conceal the abuse that Jennifer and Sarah inflicted, 
One of the women claimed that Jennifer coached the children to act and say certain things. The children were also reportedly not even allowed to cry. The following are notes taken by the CPS worker that interviewed the Hart family on August 26, 2013. Marcus, at 15 years old, appeared soft-spoken and reserved. The women who contacted CPS and knew the Hart family claimed he was specifically targeted for abuse and received the most discipline. But Marcus told a different story. He told CPS that he was grateful for Sarah and Jen for changing his life. He told them that there was more opportunity in Oregon and felt that they were contributing to the world. This painted an entirely different picture than the one made by the other two anonymous women. According to one of them, Jennifer told her that Marcus attempted to kill her, but was saved by Devante. On a different occasion, when the Hart family was at the woman's home, Jennifer alleged that Marcus tried to punch her and drug her. The woman didn't believe Jennifer, however, and said she didn't hear Marcus yelling like Jennifer said he had. In response to this allegation, Jennifer and Sarah told the CPS worker that when they adopted Marcus, he was already on psychotropic medication. However, Marcus was apparently no longer on that medication and has no mental health concerns at all. 11-year-old Hannah appeared small for her age. She had no front teeth and was told she had to wait until she was 17 or 18 years old to get a retainer with teeth. Hannah and her mothers had the same story lined up. Hannah fell while running on hardwood floors a year prior. That's how she lost her front teeth. Hannah is another child that the anonymous woman claimed was a target for abuse by the Hart women. Hannah didn't tell the CPS workers anything about being abused or harshly disciplined during the interview. Ten-year-old Devante was the most outgoing and talkative according to the documents. He introduced himself and volunteered to be interviewed first. Devante was clean and well-dressed. Jennifer said that he was very active in the music festival community and famous across the nation for his free hugs. The Hart women also told CPS that when they adopted Devante at the age of six, he only knew how to say the S word and the F word. They claimed that in Devante's prior home, he suffered abuse and was exposed to violence, drugs, and had a gun held to his head. He didn't know where his fingers and toes were when they adopted him, and he would violently bite and kick them. They claimed Devante was diagnosed with a mood disorder and ADHD, but they didn't believe those were correct, so he wasn't on any sort of medication. The anonymous women told CPS workers that Devante was the favorite child. He received much more affection and privileges than his five other siblings. According to them, Jennifer wouldn't even talk to the other children unless she was telling them to do something. Nine-year-old Abigail was reported to be reserved and small for her age, like most of her siblings. She also reportedly showed little emotion or animation. At two years old, Sarah and Jen claimed that Abigail was, quote, labeled as mentally retarded, end quote. Like Devante's conditions, the couples didn't believe it was accurate. Nine-year-old Jeremiah was described as reserved and the only child who was found on the growth charts when evaluated by the doctor. The Hart women claimed that Jeremiah had been on medication when they adopted him, but no longer needed it. They also told CPS that he couldn't use a fork when they adopted him, but was functionally normally now. It's been a trend so far during this interview with CPS that the Hart women claimed that their children were suffering before they adopted them, and that they had been the ones to build a life for them that they're so grateful for now. This further emphasized that Jen and Sarah wanted control over their image and how they were perceived. They had to bring up the traumatic past of their children to combat the fact that they had previous run-ins with CPS and even a charge of domestic assault. Sierra was the youngest of the children, just eight years old. She also had the least amount of notes during the interview. They said she's small for her age and reserved like the other children. During the interview with Jen and Sarah, Jennifer talked about how she didn't currently work, but has a degree and background in education. She claimed to be interested in social justice and a big part of the music festival community, bringing her children along. She also said that many of her family's issues have stemmed from people not understanding their alternative lifestyle of yoga, organic food, vegetarianism, etc. But people reporting issues about the family weren't concerned with the lifestyle they portrayed. They were concerned for their children, who were caught digging in the trash for food with bruises on their bodies. The CPS worker observed that during the interview, Jennifer was much more outspoken and dominated the conversation. Jennifer also refused to be interviewed alone without Sarah by her side. 
The couple claimed that they didn't move to Oregon to escape their troubled history in Minnesota. They moved because they were being harassed. They said they had their tires slashed, they were threatened, and their home was egged. Either the couple didn't file any police reports when this occurred, or none of it happened at all. The couple was ready to start a new life in Oregon that would readily accept their alternative lifestyle. The conclusion to the visit from CPS officials and the allegations against the Hart women were all deemed unable to determine. The child safety conclusion deemed that all the children were safe, but that was so far from true. On September 23rd, the CPS worker called Jennifer's cell phone. That number had been disconnected. They then left a message for Sarah asking if she was able to transfer the children's medical insurance and arrange a medical evaluation for all the children. The next day, the worker left a message for the Children's Center informing them of the interviews and history and wondering if they would see the Hart children. Apparently, to the Children's Center, the interviews and history called for the children to be seen by their primary care physician. CPS then contacted the police about Sarah and Jen's out-of-state criminal history. Through this contact, they noted that Sarah had been charged with malicious punishment of a child in 2010. However, the charge had been dropped. Sarah had also been convicted of misdemeanor domestic violence assault, an attempt to inflict bodily harm to another person. She pled guilty and went through probation. The same day CPS learned that information, they contacted an individual who knows the Hart family. She wanted to remain anonymous, and the information she gave remained confidential. She knew the family would cut her off if she was caught talking to CPS workers. Three days later, the CPS worker received a call from another woman who claimed she knew the family well and was concerned for the children. On November 19th, the CPS worker received a fax containing all six children's growth charts. The doctor indicated that there was no concern. However, Jeremiah was the only child that was on the chart for both height and weight. The rest of the Hart children were either under the desired height, weight, or both. The medical assessment of the children came four months after the anonymous tip was sent to CPS about them being undernourished. On November 25th, 2014, the Hart family attended a Black Lives Matter protest in Portland, Oregon. This protest was a response to the shooting of Michael Brown by a police officer named Darren Wilson. Devante, who would have been 11 at the time, was wearing a free hug sign at the rally. Officer Sergeant Brett Barnum approached Devante and the two shook hands. Devante was already crying, and when the officer asked why, Devante responded that it was about the current national events. Sergeant Barnum told Devante, quote, I'm sorry, and the two continued talking. Eventually, the officer pointed to the free hug sign and asked, quote, Hey, can I have one of those? As tears were streaming down Devante's face, a freelance photographer captured their embrace. That photo ended up going viral and gained national attention. The image was featured on Reddit, ABC News, CBS News, Fox News, NBC's Today Show, and many more media outlets. It was even mentioned and shown during a Saturday Night Live sketch. On Facebook, Jennifer made a post about Devante. She wrote, quote, My son has a heart of gold, compassion beyond anything I've ever experienced, yet struggles with living fearlessly when it comes to the police. He wonders if someday when he no longer wears a free hug sign around his neck, when he's a full-grown black male, if his life will be in danger for simply being. Now this is when the Hart family story takes an even darker turn. Because of this viral image, Jennifer and family friends claimed that the family was receiving death threats. While that story is believable, authorities say there's no actual evidence that they ever received any death threats at all. Judging by the history of deception from Jennifer and Sarah, it's more likely that their hunger to be perceived as white saviors got out of hand. Due to the overwhelming social media posts from the women boasting their family life, it's clear that Jennifer and Sarah Hart were fine with sharing their personal lives, as long as they had complete control over their final image. What scared them was having an audience too large to control. People could easily poke around and find the charge against Sarah for domestic assault. It was time to cut more ties and isolate themselves further. They couldn't risk tainting the perfect image they worked so hard to create, or even worse, another visit from Child Protective Services. On Jen's YouTube channel, the last post she made was on December 27th, 2014. The entire video is showcasing Devante, for 2 minutes and 39 seconds, wearing Elton John glasses and an emo hat. He's dancing in his underwear to Joni Mitchell. Devante was noted to be the more outspoken one of the group by CPS officials. He was also considered a favorite of Jen's by many family friends. 
Tevante appeared relatively thin and small for 12 years old. He also looked like he wasn't enjoying the dancing much at all. His face is emotionless, and he only flashes a brief grin a few times during the entire video. Here's what Jen's caption reads. Abby ended her 11th birthday celebration with an epic dance party last night. While I would love to share more clips from the evening, apparently not all the kids are thrilled with the notion of everyone seeing them shake their booties and their underwear. Most of the kids danced for over four hours straight until 1 a.m. This kid outlasted me. Elton John glasses, underwear, Joni Mitchell, fishy accessories, dance till dawn, just your average Friday night. In 2016, Nusheen attended a Bernie Sanders rally with the Hart family. Because there wasn't enough space, Nusheen let Hannah sit on her lap. She thought Hannah couldn't be older than seven or eight. Jen then told her, quote, you know she's 14, right? Nusheen had met the family in November of 2013 at a concert and connected instantly. She visited their Westland, Oregon home several times and described Jen as, quote, the most sensitive, gentle, humane person. When she visited, however, she wouldn't see or interact with all the children. She mostly just saw Devante and Jeremiah. Jen confided in Nusheen that the children were born addicted to drugs or alcohol, and their genetics explained their size and behaviors. Jen also claimed that none of her children would marry, have kids of their own, or live normal lives. Sadly, she was right, but it wasn't due to their genetics or troubled past. It was Jen and Sarah who would make that decision for them. According to The Oregon Live, in 2012, Jennifer detailed the troubled past she claimed Devante had before being adopted. She wrote, quote, Born into a world of drugs, pumping through his newly born body, weapons and extreme poverty, one would assume his future was bleak. By the time he was four, he had smoked, consumed alcohol, handled drugs, been shot at, and suffered severe abuse and neglect, end quote. After Jennifer drove her entire family off of a cliff and the truth was revealed, attorney Shonda Jones came forward, who was fighting for their biological aunt to keep custody of Devante, Jeremiah, and Sierra. She said, quote, Those are all lies. That did not happen. Devante was not born on drugs. I've never heard anything about being shot at or anything like that. The adoptive mother fed a lie to the public. She fed into a stereotype that reinforced other people's racism, end quote. In May of 2017, the Hart family moved to Woodland, Washington. They had very few neighbors, and the home was even more isolated than the last. The closest neighbor the Hart family did have was the DeKalbs. In late August of that year, Bruce and Dana DeKalb met one of the Hart children in a horrifying way. At 1.30 a.m., 15-year-old Hannah jumped out of her second-story bedroom window and ran to their home. She knocked on their door, and when they answered, Hannah darted to their back bedroom. She was covered in weeds and dirt and begging for their help. Hannah told Dana not to tell her mothers that she was there. Dana eventually got Hannah to calm down. That's when Hannah revealed the shocking truth. She said, quote, Don't make me go back. They're racist and they abuse us. All of a sudden, the DeKalbs heard distant screams of Hannah's name. It was the rest of the Hart family, searching for her with flashlights. Bruce called out to them against Hannah's wishes and said she was in their house. Jen barged into their home and found Hannah curled up, tucked between their bed and bedside table. Hannah was terrified as Jen approached her. Dana told Jen to back up and give Hannah some space. Jen then told Sarah to go back to the house with the other kids so she could deal with the situation. Jen crouched next to Hannah and told her she needed to apologize to the family and explain that she's been really sad and it's been a tough week. Dana recalled that Hannah became robotic in her demeanor after this. To everything Jen said, Hannah would respond, yes ma'am, with little to no emotion. Hannah eventually left with Jennifer, and the DeKalbs were left wondering what made Hannah want to escape her own home. The next morning at 6 a.m., Dana heard a knock at her door. It was Hannah again, but this time she was accompanied by Jennifer. Hannah then gave a note to Dana, and here's what it said. Dear Dana, I stopped this morning because I feel awful about disturbing your peace and worrying you in the middle of the night. I was very frustrated with my brother and didn't handle things very maturely, and I'm sorry for telling lies to get attention. I'm working on being more honest and finding better ways to communicate my frustrations. I've been pretty sad about our two cats dying recently, so I was just very sad and frustrated last night. Thank you for being kind. 
Dana asked to speak to Hannah alone, but Jennifer's response was, we do everything as a family. Jen also claimed that her children were drug babies, and that's why they sometimes acted out. When Dana told her mother about the strange experience, she in turn told her 80-year-old husband, Steve. On November 18th, months after the incident, Steve called the authorities to report Jen and Sarah. He said, quote, The other night, a little girl jumped out of the second-story window on the roof and then came down onto the ground and ran to my daughter. And this was like two in the morning, begging them to help her. My son-in-law doesn't want to get involved, but the more I sit on it, I just can't live with it. Somebody's got to go out there and check on these kids. Since she's told me about it, I just can't live with it. Those kids, I think, are in very serious danger. After authorities learned that this incident had taken place months prior to Steve's 911 call, they determined that a welfare check was not warranted based on the isolated incident. However, if they had done a little digging, they would have realized that it wasn't an isolated incident. It was one of too many. Over the next eight months, Dana and Bruce never saw the children outside, except one. They would sometimes see Jen's favorite child, Devante, outside doing chores. A week before the family perished, Devante started showing up to their home. He needed food. Specifically, he wanted tortillas, bread, and cured meat. And he wanted it in six servings, so he could share it with his brothers and sisters. He started going to the DeKalb's more and more often, and eventually Dana was comfortable enough to ask what was going on. He confided in her that Jin was withholding food. After a week of that, Dana had enough. On March 23rd, 2018, Dana called Child Protective Services and told them everything. That same day, CPS made a visit to the Hart home, but no one answered the door. That same evening, the entire Hart family fled. A detective on the case told NBC News that, quote, they both decided that this was going to be the end, that if they can't have their kids, that nobody was going to have those kids. The Hearts drove a total of 500 miles over the course of three days. It's not clear if the Hearts knew where they were going, but on the way, they paid for most of their items in cash, possibly to go undetected. On the third day of their journey, Sarah was in the passenger seat searching questions Questions about suicide, drowning, Benadryl, and overdosing. Her final searches were, Is death by drowning painful? Can 500 milligrams of Benadryl kill a 125-pound woman? How long does it take to die from hypothermia while drowning in a car? Those searches were deleted, but later recovered by authorities. Jennifer, who rarely drank, according to her, was drinking heavily at the wheel. Sarah had 42 doses of generic Benadryl in her system. They were building up the courage to do the unimaginable, kill themselves and their six adopted children. Back at the Hart family home, a CPS worker was trying to make contact for the second time, but it was too late. We don't know the whole story, and we probably never will, but we do know that Jennifer Hart drove her entire family willingly off a cliff into the Pacific Ocean. We know that Jennifer, Sarah, Marcus, Hannah, Jeremiah, Abigail, and Sierra are dead, and it's presumed, even though his body was never found, that Devante is deceased as well. After the crash, Clark County investigators searched the home. Although Jen and Sarah claimed to be strict vegetarians, authorities found a fridge stocked with hot dogs, ham, chicken breasts, ground beef, and frozen tilapia. Although Sarah only drank occasionally, there were 17 bottles of wine on their kitchen counters. The couple was also drowning in credit card debt, they had paid $8,000 off to bring the total money owed down to $21,000. Half of the family's income relied on their adoptive children, which brought them $30,000 a year. After Marcus turned 18, those payments decreased by $550 a month. Nathaniel Davis, the stepfather of Devante and Jeremiah, was reportedly sending over ten dollars a year to the family. According to a detective that searched the Hart family home, quote, there was very little to show the children had access to any toys or items of entertainment, save for some board games found in the downstairs family room. But what investigators found most disturbing was that they couldn't figure out where the children had even slept. Sarah and Jen had their own room with a double bed. One room had two love seats and a padded mat on the floor. Another room held a single twin bed. Where were the children sleeping? A friend of the Hart family noticed something in one of Jin's Facebook photos that had been overlooked before. The children were all painting pictures. 
but there wasn't any paint on their brushes. If only these minor and major details hadn't been overlooked before, would they still be here today? Thank you guys so much for watching. Please give the video a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to see more. You can also follow me on TikTok and Instagram, where I post true crime daily.